Hey guys, welcome back. So this is another video in the Iron Man Mark III build series. And this time we're talking filament. And this is gonna be a little more technical than the other videos, but stay with me. I think you're gonna learn a lot. So as you can see here, this big stack of filament, and there's way more off camera, came from Polymaker. Uh, they had a sponsorship form you could fill out and they granted my wish. I'm certain I'm gonna need way more than what I received, but that's okay, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So we're gonna be talking about filament calibration and calibrating your printer in general too. A couple reasons why that's important is, well, we want dimensional accuracy. We wanna make sure that if we're asking the printer to print these big giant pieces and we have to put them all together, we wanna to make sure everything fits together. So we're gonna be learning how to do that. Um, also, when you do these small calibration prints, uh, it's much cheaper to fail at this level versus the much bigger level. Uh, and then the other thing too is, you know, you also are going to get stronger 3D prints because you're going to rule out the extrusion issues. If you're under extruding, you're going to have prints that feel like styrofoam. Or if you're over extruding, you're going to have a big blobby mess of lines and it's just not going to be a whole lot of fun to post process. So that said, we have a lot to talk about. I'm looking forward to showing you how this all works. Are you ready? Let's do this. Welcome back. So let me start with, hello, my name is Paul, and this is my channel where nerdy is cool. I am huge into 3D printing. I've done numerous 3D printing upgrade videos, calibration tutorials, you get it, I'm into it. Uh, I've got a full size R2D2, Stormtrooper suit, bat suit. Uh, there's so many things I'm into, it's not worth explaining all of them. So hello. Um, if this is your first time seeing me, I would love it if you hit the subscribe button down below. I'm so close to 10,000, someday I'll get there. And it wouldn't hurt to give me a like. Thank you very much. So, in this video, we're talking about filament. And before I go too far, I want to talk about this great big stack of filament sitting next to me. So this is the Polymaker, uh, this is the PLA Pro material. And how did I get it? Well, they have a sponsorship, uh, sponsorship form uh, that you can fill out. Let me show you where that is if you're curious about that. So if you go to their store and go under um, the contact us, you can see they have a sponsorship right here and there's a little form you can fill out, which ta-da, there it is. And that's what I filled out. They got back to me a short time later and said, hey, how much do you need? Tell us about the project and well, Here's a big old stack of filament and there's even more off camera. Now, initially, I was really hoping to use their uh, Cos PLA. It's a more sandable, it's designed for a cosplay, so for, you know, projects like this. Um, but that material is very, very hard to get. So I went for the next best thing and I have it here on my screen, which I'll share with you if we're a little off topic, but that's okay. Um, so I went with the Polylite PLA Pro and what I like about this is this has the best mix of being very rigid and high impact resistance. And that's what this has. It has the best of both worlds. Now, what I would have loved to have gotten is this stuff right here. It's the Polylite Cos PLA uh, and the Type B, which is extra durable and very sandable. But I just can't get this stuff. And uh, when I inquired about it, I got the usual. It's on a boat somewhere. So that's where it's at. Okay, so let's get back on track here. So first of all, I got a whole pile of notes here, so I apologize for cheating a little bit here. But the first thing I also want to introduce you to is this amazing website, which I'm trying to pull up really quick here for you. And let me go to that screen. This is the t -Teen Tech 3D Printer Calibration. Uh, Michael, if you haven't seen his YouTube channel, I'm certain you have if you found me. He does some amazing uh, tutorials and reviews and things like that. Um, he has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. I, I, if I get mentioned by him, I would feel thrilled. But anyway, uh, so he has gone through and not only made videos, but he's given introductions across the top here on every step of the way of all the things that you would want to do to properly calibrate your 3D printer. But most importantly, what we're gonna cover is calibrating your material. That's super important for what we're looking to do. So that's one of the things I wanted to cover right away. Now, before we get too carried away about how do we do all this stuff, one of the important things that's gonna be is drying your material. A lot of people raise their nose or a snub me if I mention you know, drying PLA, but you don't know what's in the secret sauce of what they're making. <laughs> 
that. So it, another thing you can do is, I know Polymaker has it listed on their technical data sheets and their safety data sheets, is that drawing is not required if coming fresh out of the package. So that's fine. Now, other vendors may have different information, so check those out. The reason I mention this is that a lot of filaments, as they're produced in the production line, they go through a water tank and that's how they cool the filament and then spool it up and, and ship it out. Now, some, some use you know, air blasting and other methods to dry that material before it's shipped out. Or, quite, I mean, it could be as simple as you receive material that doesn't look like it's vacuum packed and who knows how long it sat, sat on the shelf somewhere. So anyway, to rule out a lot of the issues when you're calibrating your 3D prints and your filament, if it's dry, you're gonna get your best results. Now, as far as filament dryers, what's the best, what to use, that's, that's a whole other can of worms. I'm not gonna go there right now because that's an entire video all by itself. So, moving on, let's look at some of the first steps on our screen here as far as what we're gonna be doing. So, one of the first things he mentions is a frame check. Some of these things I'm just gonna skim through because they're very self-explanatory, but the most important thing I feel here is what's called PID Auto-Tune, and he gives all the information in G-code that you're going to need to make this work. Now, what does this mean? What does PID Auto-Tune mean? What it does is, on the hot end and also on the bed, what it does is it calibrates the firmware so that if you tell the firmware that, okay, I want you to calibrate my hot end for 205 degrees Celsius, it's gonna do that, it's gonna give you the information and the settings with what he's given you. You can automatically input that into your command line. But in the world of 3D printing, what that means is as you're watching your hot end heat up, it's gonna do a better job of getting there and staying there very stable. So that's what's important right there. And it's the same story with the bed as well too. If you give it the command line for, hey, I wanna do the PID on the bed heater, I want that to stay at, for example, 60 degrees Celsius, which is very common for PLA that's what you want. What you don't want is you don't want to have your printer, you know, constantly overshooting and undershooting the temperature. You want it to kind of stay right there, you know, nice flat line. So that's what PID Auto-Tune will do. One of the next things you want to do is this is the extruder E-steps. So essentially what this does is the firmware tells the extruder how many times to turn to extrude X amount of material. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure and we're testing it. We're saying, okay, send me 120 millimeters of, of material and we're gonna measure it from the top and see how much really goes through. And then we're gonna adjust, you know, plus or minus to get that as accurate as possible because right now we're just calibrating the firmware to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. Now there's a couple great tutorials for this. Obviously we're gonna be talking about teaching tech. One of the first ones I used was Matt's blog, uh, Matt's hub rather. And again, this came back out in 2017, so. <laughs> this goes back a ways. Now this is very wordy, but very detailed and tells you everything you need to know. Now for those of us that have shorter attention spans, uh, fortunately Michael at Teaching Tech has also covered this under Extruder E-Steps and goes through it step by step and breaks it up nicely. So it's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, and we'll talk about right here is if you don't have a metric uh, ruler, one of the great things I'd suggest getting is a caliper. And we'll talk a little bit more about these as we get into other settings, but don't go cheap on your tools. Get something that's gonna be accurate and good. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that we, we all kind of cringe a little when we spend that much for tools, but in, in hindsight, it, it's really great. So don't, don't go cheap on your tools because they'll really help you out. Okay, next he talks about bed leveling and first layer, I believe he calls it over here. And this is something that I think a lot of people uh, kind of don't pay attention to here. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, posts on the Facebook groups and elsewhere where people really have a lot of problem with that first layer. And a couple of graphics like this one on the bottom really you know, explain it very nicely. So a couple of sidebars that I will mention is that a um, couple things. Um, if you're using the included surface, if you have a glass bed or something like that, make sure it is super clean. Do it with dun, 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 isopropyl alcohol and also avoid paper towels or anything like that. Uh, I use a lot of these microfiber cloths because they don't leave any lint behind. So that's one way you could do it. Another way you could do it, and again, these are only usually 70%, uh, but alcohol uh, prep pads uh, come in very handy too. Ah, making a mess. 
The other thing uh, that's worth mentioning, and I'll talk about Wham Bam because I love their surfaces, is that if you're not happy with the surface you have, there's a couple options you can do. Uh, Wham Bam uh, uses a nice reflection, uh, PEX, and they also have the magnetic bed, and this is spring steel, so when it's time for your print to come off, it's pretty easy to flex this and get it off of there. This additional surface, uh, this has that uh, rough coarse finish, so if you want to have uh, that pattern on the bottom of your print, um, you tend to do a little bit more squish on these, I found, and cleaning these can be a little bit more challenging because uh, they're a little coarser. But if you're not happy with the way your print is sticking down or if you're having first layer issues, first step would be make sure it's clean. Um, another option would be if you're using these beds, also make sure they're clean. With the Wham Bams, they include steel wool, so usually every couple prints you want to rough it up a little, clean it with the IPA, and you're good to go. The other thing you could do is adhesion promoter, and for a bald guy like me, it's fun to show this stuff off. Aquanet, polyvinyl alcohol, or glue stick. So depending on the material you're using, on PLA, I don't think you're going to need these, but on other materials, for example, PETG, ABS, and others, um, these are uh, some other tools of the trade that you may be looking to use. Okay, so you've already gone through, we've made sure the first, the surface rather, is going to be nice and clean. You're going to do the first layer as he suggests. Now, if you have a 3D printer that has a proximity sensor or a BL touch or something, you have the ability to do what's called baby stepping. So you can fine tune that first layer because you want to make sure you're not too close. You want to make sure you're not too high. You want to be right there in the sweet spot because we want that print to stick. Okay, this next one trips up a lot of people and it is the slicer flow and it's very important. And he has a, again, he lays it out very well. Uh, I'll show you here on the screen here where he talks about exactly the settings you want to run. And uh, we have a test cube. And uh, as you can see on my camera, I have all kinds of test cubes that I've done for all kinds of materials. Uh, I've got them all labeled from 100% what the flow setting was. I got the left side, right side, back, front. So I label all that. And uh, a side note on all of this, as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that as we're going to be measuring these sides here to determine the flow rate, and we're dealing with pretty thin walls, you want to make sure you get a really, really good uh, caliper. Now, there are two things you could do. You could do a caliper, or you could do a micrometer. The micrometers are a bit more expensive, but uh, we have one at work, and they're, they're just fantastic. Let me show you on screen uh, what those guys are right now. So this is the micrometer. So what you would do is you would put the print in there, you would spin this crank, uh, and this would pinch it and it would tell you exactly, you know, what the width is. And it's just, oh, it's, it's such a nice tool. It's just $139. So <laughs> it's on my bucket list of things I got to get for myself. For the rest of us, we'll probably have some sort of caliper like this. Now, I like the Matoyo. I, I, I want to say I paid about this much money for mine. And the biggest thing you want to make sure is, you know, you don't want to go cheap on your tools. As I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure you get something that's good and accurate. Um, and has some ability to be calibrated. Uh, these are great. There are other brands I'm sure that are out there that people will like. We'll chime in in the uh, comment section about what they like. But uh, essentially, what you want to make sure is if you're going to be measuring, you know, you know, you know 0.4 and other measurements, you want to make sure your calipers are uh, good and consistent. So, what I recommend doing and what I have on most of these prints is just like what Michael's doing, is I do one wall. So, for example, uh, depending on the uh, uh, printer I have it on. I believe this one was done on a 0.6 nozzle. Yep, so these are coming up as right around point, uh, it's probably upside down for you, 0 0.65, I think. Yep, so this was done at 100%. So going through Michael's tutorial, uh, what you would do, would you'd go through and adjust the flow. And if you're wondering uh, what is the flow and where would I do that, let's go back to the other monitor here. And right here in Cura, you would find this under material and flow, and this is the variable that you would be changing. Um, I find with a lot of the materials on my machines, this number tends to be less than 100 actually, um, especially once I do the single wall prints. Uh, I find that a lot of my stuff winds up being between 92 and 95%. This is interesting uh, that very few of them show up as 100. I have had some that are perfect right off, right off the bat, but for the most part, I, I've found that I've had to uh, dial back the flow uh, just a tad bit. Now, it's one thing to test this thing with one wall. I also find it very important that, for example, if I know I'm going to be doing some 3D prints and it's going to be using three or four walls, 
Sometimes what I'll do is I'll do a, one of these cubes and I'll do three walls or four walls and measure and see how close I come to that as well. So it's important to get the baseline, but I also find it it's very important to also uh, calibrate based on what your actual settings are going to be. So just a little pro tip from Paul. Okay, so one of the most famous ones that everyone knows of and probably cringes about, and I'm going to turn on the other camera here, uh, is the temperature towers because we've all seen these and I, I understand the complaints because sometimes people do them and they're like, every layer looks the same. What am I supposed to do? Or you may come up with ones like this and you're just, just not sure because what happens, I think, is people get locked into, oh, let me get the uh, focus to be a little bit happier here. But uh, sometimes people will, will get kind of transfixed on the bridging. And really, you're not going by how well it bridges. That, you know, just because, you know, this one came out good uh, or better than the rest, you know, that doesn't mean that's the right temperature. What you also want to do is you want to check out the details. You want to look at the sides. You want to look at the corners, see how those came out. And I can show you here on some other ones here uh, where certain areas, you know, could have come out better than others. So that's one thing to be looking out for on like all these guys. Yeah, like this one did really good up here based on the bridging. But if we look at the corners and the sides, and if we look at some of these details, you know, some of them did a little bit better than others. So don't get caught in the trap where it's only, you know, that, that bridging that matters. The other thing I'm gonna point out, I'm gonna go back to my big camera here, is if you take these and hold them to the light, sometimes you'll see little hairs, okay? Now, when people see hairs or a strain, the first thing they think is retraction. But if your temperature isn't qu quite quite right, you can also have that going on too. And as I hold this one to the light, and it's gonna be hard to show on camera, but there are a little bit of hairs on the bottom, but as we go a little bit cooler, they all go away. So be aware of that too. Now, there's a couple ways you can do this. Now, Michael's page right here on temperature tuning goes through. And what's really cool, what he's changed here over the last year or two has been right here. This is for a 0.4 nozzle, 0.2 layer height. And this is what it's gonna to do to create a tower and you're gonna set the different temperature ranges. Now, what about if you have a 0.6 nozzle or a 0.8 nozzle or a one, point, you know, one millimeter nozzle? You know, how in the world are you gonna calibrate that? Well, he actually already has in here a couple pre-configured profiles for bigger nozzles than 0.4 or even smaller. So don't feel like, you know, this is only gonna do, you know, one particular nozzle size. So he's, he's got that figured out for you. So that's really, really cool that he's got that all done. The other thing I wanted to show is in Cura, if you're looking for something else, as far as, you know, how do I create these temperature towers uh, and I don't wanna use, or if I've, if I've done Michaels and I'm not happy the way those came out, uh, the ones I showed you, these came out of a plugin and this is, let me go under extensions. It's called Auto Towers, and you can get it through the marketplace. And right through here, Temperature Tower PLA. Boom, there it is. And it's gonna go from 230 to 180. Now I found on a couple materials <laughs> that I've done this with, uh, sometimes it'll stop creating a temperature tower at a certain temperature, which is okay. So don't panic if that happens to you. So once this is done and on screen, all you have to do is slice. The automatic uh, mode is already there for you. You just slice it and you're set to go. Boom, done. And this will take one hour, 18 minutes. And again, we're only talking nine grams of material. So for those of you that think the calibration is a waste of material, no, no. I mean, we're, we're talking like close to nothing. So a couple ways you can do this and Again, don't get hooked into just looking at the bridging. Look all around, hold it to the light, and uh, find out what that sweet spot is. Okay, next up is retraction. And again, uh, this is gonna be determining exactly how much your material retracts uh, to give you a clean um, print. Uh, you don't wanna have those strings or hairs. Uh, what I'll show you here on his page is he has a whole um, explanation of how it all works. You have retraction distance, retraction speed. Some people have extra restart. Um, I'm a fan of the Z-hop. Uh, I like the idea that uh, it will Z-hop at retracting, meaning it's gonna move the nozzle up a little bit as it goes and starts the next layer. Um, but again, through here, he's got it all configured based on whatever your nozzle size is. Uh, and then you would fill out, basically, 
Now here's where it's interesting because if you have a direct drive, chances are your retraction distance is gonna be less than one millimeter. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, depending on uh, the particular hot end you have, for example, I have a lot of the uh, slice uh, hot ends and what they usually recommend with the uh, slice nozzles, uh, especially paired with the Vontech direct drive, generally the retraction distance is gonna be the diameter of the nozzle, meaning if you have a 0.4 nozzle on there, your retraction distance is probably gonna be 0.4 but calibrate to be sure based on the material. So what you would do is, for example, if I wanted to test that, I would go 0.4, and then I might go for the next layer, I might go you know, 0.5 and work my way up. Uh, my retraction speed, you'll wanna double check this in your settings or the profile of your printer. I know, uh, for example, my machines have a Bontech extruder and the Bontech extruder is running at 35 millimeters a second. So I would change all these guys to 35. Uh, I don't have extra restart. I don't have that, but I do do a one millimeter Z hop. So if you use that setting, this is where you would change that. And let me show you over here. Here's a couple that I have done. And as you can see, there's no stringing, meaning I have my settings just right. Again, this is a thing where you want to hold it to the light, make sure that, uh, let me go here, and we're looking around. I got this giant spotlight in my face here, and I don't see any strings, and the same thing with the other guy. So, and what's interesting is I started at 0.4 and worked all the way up to 0.8, and there's no strings whatsoever. So I could basically use any of those settings, but I stuck with the 0.4 because I had no issues. So there we go. So that's retraction in a nutshell and on to the next one. Okay, we just finished up retraction and he does have, we can go through speed and flow tuning. I haven't done this because honestly, I print slow. All of my printers are largely bed slingers, so I don't try to push them into crazy speeds. Uh, but if you do want to go, you know, see what you can do or how fast you can really print, he has all kinds of information here. Same thing with the acceleration tuning, uh, which can help you with ringing. And you can see he's got some stuff here. So this, depending on uh, if you want to be an advanced student or not here, uh, you can check those out. Uh, one of the ones that I did do is what's called linear advance. You have to make sure that your firmware has this updated. And essentially what this does is that um, when you go and start your print, sometimes you'll notice uh, the very start of it will have a little blob or a little circle. Uh, so what this does is it does a whole pattern generator here. And uh, let me blow that up here. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get rid of that giant blob here at the beginning and start. What you're trying to get is a very consistent line. So basically between here and here, these three here are looking pretty good. So he would go through and fine tune the settings for that. Yeah, that one actually is yeah, a little break here, but this one is almost spot on. So you're just looking for a good consistent straight line. You know, you don't want to have a great big blob at one end or the other. So it's just another way of improving your print accuracy. And I believe, I think I have on one of these, um, where you will see it. Uh, let me get all my toys out here, guys. Sometimes you can see it exaggerated in the corner here. I don't think this one had it too bad. I've gone through and did this with all my machines a few months ago, but... Uh, no, it's not really there. I don't have a good example, but if you had this, you would see a very big consistent blob in the very corner, or it would be a very thick corner is what it would look like. So that's what to look for. It doesn't take too long to do. It's, it's, it's interesting to go through the command lines. Uh, there's a Marlin pattern generator that does all this. And uh, it doesn't take long to do, but you do notice um, that that first, when you, when you do those first couple prints that it suddenly, all that issue goes away. This one is not in his calibration uh, website. This is something else that I do that's a little bit uh, different. And uh, let me show you what it is. Uh, this is a 3D printer test. And what it does is it does an overhang test. And let me show you on the other uh, camera what it does. So what these do is we're trying to see exactly what our overhang angle is. So we're trying to figure out how far over can we print before we start having issues on the bottom here. And uh, I've done this with a couple with different size nozzles, and you can see we, we definitely have some issues with this guy as we, as we go up. Uh, you're going to find on a great deal of these, depending on your printer and how good the uh, uh, part fan cooling can be, 
Uh, I find that on most of my printers, I can hit 60 really well, 75, maybe a little bit problematic. Um, and then of course it does all these other print uh, tests on the bottom here. And this machine, <laughs> it's the cheap little Mingda of all things, just absolutely rocked it with this, you know, this little test print. So I will show you on Thingiverse where this is right now on the second monitor. Uh, so this is the overhang test. And uh, this is the little mini all-in-one. I will put links to these guys in the uh, video description so you can download them and try them. But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see uh, how, how well, after you've done all these calibrations, um, to do these things. The other thing I like about this particular print is what I like to do, and we'll do a separate video on uh, figuring out tree supports and other support material. Uh, I use this as a test print and I'll activate supports for it. And the hard part is trying to find out what the exact Z distance, what the sweet spot is, as far as how far your support is from the actual model um, and how easy it comes off. But that's, again, that's a topic for a new video. But yeah, both of these guys are called overhang tests. Uh, this is the uh, mini overhang test, and uh, this one is the all-in-one 3D printer test. Um, these are really fun to print, and uh, uh, as you can see on the one that I did here in blue, uh, I, again, the $300 printer that just keeps on surprising me, the, the Mingda <laughs> Magician Pro. So uh, uh, then the very bottom layer has the uh, little combi test thing on the bottom. So that is another one that you can add to your list of things to do, to try, to make sure everything is as dialed in as possible before you go jumping into the big prints. Okay, that's it for this time. I've talked enough about calibration to yeah, keep you busy for a while. Uh, I hope you find this information very useful though and you can understand why we go through all these steps before we invest the time and materials and money and electricity uh, into these larger 3D prints. So there's a reason. And that's it for this time. If you want to see what I'm working on, check me out on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and of course, Twitter. And that's it. So thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And please remember, please print safe.